question. Corinne Piquesa. Corey. Whoops. <laughs> I'm sorry, after all our tests, I'm still having trouble getting the buttons to work. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. So happy to see you all here. Um, as you heard, we are entering some time of strategic thinking, certainly a period of transformation, um, which I do recognize can make us feel tired, but is really an opportunity for us to, to look collectively moving forward um, and an opportunity uh, to rethink how we do what we do, how we can do it better, have more impact, how we can be more engaged. So I look forward to hearing from you. There are um, opportunities to provide input on the research themes, the plan overall, um, and where we need to invest strategically in our, our future research and innovation enterprise. So um, look forward to, to learning more from you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor P. Gesa. Uh, now, uh, in, and indeed, we'll look forward to hearing more from you as well later today in the town hall. Now, I'd like to bring back Executive Vice Chancellor Elizabeth Simmons, who is going to provide some further content about today's town hall and how the topics being discussed today support the current strategic plan refresh that is underway at the university. Elizabeth. Thanks very much. Yes, I'll say a few words to set the context. Just really love Fallen Star, so I'm glad we have that that uh, that slide. Uh, next slide, please. So to uh, as the next slide. Yes, here we go. Uh, so the strategic plan reminds us all that we need to be student centered, research focused, and service oriented. And academic affairs has been using a collective impact method of collaboration to advance the strategic plan by helping us work together more effectively so we can get more impact for all of the work that we're already doing. Now, keeping student-centered, research-focused, service-oriented in mind, let's go to the next slide, which shows us several of the major topics for discussion today. You can see that they map very neatly onto the strategic plan ideas. For example, one thing we'll be discussing is how a service-oriented culture reflects the pride that we take in our work. And there will be a discussion about transparency so that people can get uh, information that they need, clarity, and really understand how everybody's work contributes to the strategic plan. We will be talking about how to be research focused in ways that maximize the impact of our research by having larger collaborations in new interdisciplinary areas and having facilities to support that work, for example. And we'll also talk about on the academic side and the student-centered side, um, summer as an opportunity to do more for students to do more perhaps for other audiences, to do more for faculty. Uh, what could summer mean to our students or to uh, other people in the community? And uh, where could we go with that? So those are examples of some of the things that we will be discussing today. And the next slide, I wanted to just say a few words about what's at the heart of the way that we have structured today's town hall Change requires communication, and that communication needs to be very honest about what needs to change and why, and it needs to be honest about why certain changes are or aren't possible, which changes have been made, and so forth. So it's important for us all to remember, if we see something isn't working, we need to remember to tell the person or the office that could actually fix it. I mean, it's great to complain to oneself, that's great, it makes us feel a little better, but we do need to tell whoever, whoever could, make, could, uh, could fix the issue. On the other hand, if you are the somebody who has fixed the issue, it's important to let the person who brought it up know so they understand that you heard them, you appreciated what they were saying, and you have changed things, you, you've uh, improved the situation. This kind of bi-directional communication is really important so that we know we hear each other, we build trust in one another, we build trust that we can talk about difficult issues and about things that need fixing and st 
stand together looking at the problem and figuring out how to fix it instead of feeling ourselves on opposite sides of an issue somehow. If we can keep communicating in this kind of way, we will be able to do even more amazing things as a university than we've already been doing. So I hope that today in the interactive portions, you will take this opportunity to do some of this communicating and then the, through the Q&A, we can also have more bi-directional communication and keep improving the university. That's the context I wanted to set. So back to you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, EBC Simmons. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Carlos Jensen, Associate Vice Chancellor for Educational Innovation. And he's going to talk about the expansion of summer session. And as I mentioned in the introduction, and uh, we're going to have an interactive component today. And Allison Sanders, our Assistant Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and Chief of Staff, will be assisting with our live feedback following each presentation. She will join us after Carlos's presentation. Carlos, I turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, and I'm very glad that Allison's gonna join us for the interactive portion because I would be completely lost trying to do that on my own. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about summer and the opportunities of summer session. And just start by acknowledging that um, this university really stood up um, over the pandemic and, and in the period um, uh, since to increase the offerings and the opportunities available to students during summer session. Uh, during the pandemic, we saw enrollments during summer session go up by 50%, and they've remained relatively steady since then. But there's a lot of opportunity to do even better. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so summer session plays a major role in the success and in the journey that many of our students take. Um, it can be used by incoming students to get a head start, especially those students who need to catch up or in other ways uh, need to address some deficiency before they can start their major. Um, we also have quite a number of students who are working to either create a gap where they can then go and do uh, um, an internship or some other experiential learning opportunity or who need opportunities to simply finish out their degree uh, and finish out on time. Summer session can be quite financially beneficial, especially to out-of-state and international students, as everyone pays a reduced uh, fixed amount for the uh, tuition uh, during summer. And we've seen this. Um, in, in previous summers, we've had students who have successfully, with a GPA of 3.0 uh, or better, uh, completed up to 30 units of work during the summer. So it's incredibly important. Um, and it, it allows students to, again, take ownership or more control over their own journey. It can also be beneficial for the departments, the programs, the university as a whole, as summer is one of our opportunities to offload some of the incredible pressure that we feel sometimes uh, in terms of physical infrastructure around especially key uh, um, uh, facilities like labs, et cetera. So this is a, a, another opportunity for us to spread out the, what would be uh, typically a very high teaching load during the fall, much higher than during winter or spring. And as most of you will have seen, um, we revamped and rethought um, our incentives, um, both what faculty compensation uh, looks like, as well as what department incentives looks like. And hopefully this uh, will create a more um, attractive opportunity for departments as well as faculty to contribute during the summer. So if we go to the next slide. So what are we doing to make summer more appealing and more impactful? Um, so centrally, we are doing a lot of data analysis to try to identify what the most impactful opportunities, the most impactful courses that we can offer are to students. And part of this is looking at every degree plan, every requirement for every uh, degree, and trying to identify where are the, the roadblocks, where are the bottlenecks. And so we use a, a system called curricular analytics to identify uh, prereq chains and where high DFW courses or waitlisted courses or courses that are only offered uh, once a year or twice a year um, 
And, and we've created basically an incentive list, a high impact course list that will be published on Summer Sessions websites and, and EI's website uh, this Friday, uh, showing which are the courses that would most positively impact students if we were to offer it. And it's a combination of those factors, so we're trying to be much more data driven. Obviously, that changes every term, that changes every year, um, and we can't, from where we're sitting, necessarily identify every high impact course. And so we, we really want to get feedback from the units. If there's a, there's a course that's not made it onto our list, we're uh, perfectly willing to listen to you and to, to work with you. So that's um, where we are at. There's still opportunities to add additional summer courses. Uh, and to, to sign up for additional summer teaching. Uh, and I encourage you to take a look at that. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Allison to lead us through the interactive portion of the program. Thanks so much, Carlos. So as promised, uh, we're adding a new element to our town hall to gather feedback from all of you and increase the input we receive from the many voices uh, across campus. So attendees, you may use your smartphone and scan the QR code that you can see on the screen. If you can see that on the screen, yeah. Um, or go to your browser and go to www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and then enter the code that's on this page that you should see now. This will allow you to participate in the interactive question sessions um, and provide answers. Uh, it's gonna be a lot of different formats that you'll see. Uh, pretty straightforward. Um, so I'll give you a moment to do this, to log on to Mentimeter. Just a note, uh, don't close the Mentimeter window once you're logging in, uh, once you've logged in, because uh, we're going to be using it throughout the rest of our town hall today. So I'll give you uh, folks a few minutes to uh, log into Mentimeter and get ready for our first question. All right. Just a few more seconds, and then we'll go ahead and get started with our first question, uh, which will be focused on expanding summer academic offerings. And here we go. So this is gonna be a multiple choice question, and you can select more than one response. Um, those of you who've used Mentimeter in the past, you'll be able to see that the chart will react in real time as new responses come in. So the first question is, what factors should be considered in setting summer priorities? And just a note, uh, we do currently account for uh, DFW uh, rates, wait lists, cadence of offerings, and some of the complexities of sequences and prerequisites as Carlos shared in his presentation. Mentimeter is such a great tool to really see how responses are changing. Okay. Excellent. All right. So you can see in, in real time uh, where we're starting to see some responses. Excellent. Okay, so um, we have a second question. Actually, we're gonna have three questions, but the second question that we have is a short answer question. And uh, the responses, we're not going to show the responses on the screen, uh, but in a moment, once, once the, um, the session is, is complete, 
Um, I'll read some of the few, I'll share some of the few responses that we have out loud, and then we'll be sharing these uh, later in a, in a full report um, after the town hall. So the second question, remember a short answer, how does your department strategize summer course offerings? You should see us and you can see the question on the slide. And again, it would be too much to share all of the responses, but we'll give you a little time to respond, and then we'll have a couple of uh, responses to share. It's not as much fun as watching the, the graphs change as responses are coming in, but um, hopefully we'll be able to Share some high level summary. Okay, our back end team is working hard to refresh some of the responses. And again, we'll be compiling these as they come in and sharing them in a summary report at a later time. Okay, so we seem to be having some technical difficulties on some of the responses. So we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next question. Uh, going back to our original format, multiple, uh, you'll be asked to rank, rank the options in this case in order of importance, with number one as the most impactful and number five as the least impactful. And uh, again, the chart will react in real time as responses come in. Um, so the question is, what barriers could impact you or your department offering summer courses? So again, use Mentimeter. It seems that the top ranked is the top ranked. Okay, we've got about 20% of folks responding. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Uh, again, please keep your Mentimeter screen open so that you can continue to participate in our feedback sessions, uh, which will happen uh, following each of today's pre presentations. So back to you, Bob. Well, thank you, uh, Carlos and Allison, for powering our first interactive uh, feedback session. Now, I'd like to invite Dr. John Moore, our Dean of Undergraduate Education, to talk about the Western Associated Schools and Colleges, or WASC, midpoint review, and our campus's approach to completing the report as part of our reaccreditation process. John. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, we have the next slide, please. So um, WASC, uh, the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, it, there's another organization which includes WASC, which is called the, um, the WASC Senior College and University Commission. And this is the organization that actually accredits higher education for the Western states, um, well, California, Hawaii, and the Pacific region. And so that has the acronym WSCUC, but it's still pronounced WASC. So, for one who hates acronyms, this is this is acronym hell. 
But nevertheless, this is um, the agency that accredits our university. Accreditation is very important. It allows institutions um, to sustain and develop effective educational programs. It also assures the community that and the public that the institution has met high standards of quality and effectiveness. And then from a very practical point of view, accreditation by a nationally recognized agency such as WASC is required for students to receive federal student aid from the US Department of Education. So we would essentially not be able to do business if we were not accredited. Next slide, please. So here's the accreditation cycle, the current accreditation cycle. So in 2019, um, our campus submitted a self-study and an institutional report in advance of our reaffirmation of accreditation review. And that happened over the next year or so. And by February 2020, we received our reaffirmation of accreditation. We received the letter. Um, that part of our, our letter said that we need to submit an interim report. This is very typical. Um, halfway through our, our next accreditation. So that would be in November of um, 2024. And then after that, we will start the whole cycle again around 2029 to be reaffirmed um, again in, we hope in fall 2029. Next slide, please. So the outcomes in 2020, first of all, we, um, we had a reaffirmation of our accreditation for a period of 10 years, and that's the maximum that you're able to get. So that was very good. It was a very good outcome. Um, we had, the letter had six commendations and eight areas that we need to address in our next accreditation cycle. And um, also that we need to submit an interim report. This is this is very standard for accreditation of 10 years. Um, and so that's due in November. The interim report is essentially um, giving a progress report on the eight areas that we need to address. Next slide, please. Okay, so our commendations, uh, the quality of our self-study was thought to be very thorough and self-reflective. Um, we were commended on the creation of the teaching and learning commons. Uh, the senior leadership was commended for its common vision focused on student success and being collaborative. The comment was that some places you have Game of Thrones and we were not Game of Thrones. Um, campus financial management, budget and resource allocation was bold, successful and transparent. Um, also an atypical visionary mode of planning with a proactive focus on the future. And then finally, strengthening ties between the campus and community, and they, they singled out the trolley as an example. Notice that this was before Eighth College's community-engaged curriculum had been developed. And so that seems to, like something that we continue with. Next slide, please. The areas to address, there's eight of them. I'm go through them pretty quickly. One was to continue to improve graduation rates with the goal of achieving a 75% four-year graduation rate by 2023. Um, well, we we actually have already achieved that. No, I'm sorry, that shouldn't be by 2023, um, by the, our next accreditation. Um, we already are essentially at 75% four-year graduation rate, just a little bit shy of it, but we are essentially there. And then the second was to eliminate the equity gap. So while we're at about 75% four-year graduation rate, if you disaggregate by various demographic factors such as Pell eligibility, first generation, underrepresented, um, you see some real gaps in the four-year graduation rate. So um, we, as you probably have heard, we have a collective impact approach to addressing equity gaps with several initiatives now underway. Uh, then another issue was to continue to work on assessment for educational effectiveness and integrate it with program reviews. Um, Assessment of learning outcomes is something that WASC asks us all to do. It's something that's very difficult to, to get buy-in on from faculty. However, over the past couple of years, we have been meeting with all of the departments, um, my office as well as the Teaching and Learning Commons, and discussing um, assessment as a way of addressing equity gaps. And um, we've, gotten, we've gotten some traction on this. Um, I, it's, it's not universal and we still have work to do, but I think we are making progress. And also um, we worked with the Academic Senate to ensure that 
addressing equity gaps now as part of the charge for program reviews so that when a when a unit is being reviewed um they need to talk about how they're addressing equity gaps and the program review committee should be evaluating that another issue is assess the many diversity and student success programs we have a lot of these programs we don't necessarily have data on how successful they are and um, we may want to um to devote resources to the ones that are most successful we do have some good assessment um in student retention and success around um, summer bridge um, we, in the commons we have some very good assessment around supplemental instruction so we're continuing to look at that but this is something that's a work in progress next slide please um also um, we are asked to resist pressure to increase enrollment targets allowing for modest growth um now we're already at our 2030 undergraduate target of 32,000 undergraduate students. We're actually a little bit above that if you take the three quarter average, uh, quite a bit above it if we take the fall census. Um, now we have implemented now new enrollment management strategies using a wait list that allows us to um, manage some of this enrollment. If you look historically at our, our increase in enrollment, it's due to two factors. One is increase in our enrollment targets and the other is is the excess yield beyond our targets that we had for many many years sometimes very significantly we have now um, brought the excess yield under control so our yield is essentially in line with our targets on the other hand uh, setting those targets is a complicated ongoing discussion with the office of the president um, and is also tied to the compact with the governor that is asking for an increase of essentially one percent in uh, California resident enrollment or FTEs, student FTEs over yearly for the next several years. Now, the student FTE actually um, is interesting because any enrollment that we have in the summer, summer session enrollment counts towards our FTE count and allows us to, um, um, it allows us not to have to enroll as many students. And these are essentially our existing students. So. Related to the previous discussion, a robust summer is critical for this as well. We were also asked to diversify our non-resident undergraduates. There was concern that that our undergraduate um, non-residents came essentially from one country, and um, we have increased domestic non-residents. Um, we have non-residents are both domestic from the United States and then international. It's now the case that our domestic and international um, non-resident enrollment is almost identical. They're almost 50% of our, of our, of our non-residents. Um, we are also attracting international students from more diverse countries. So we are making some progress there. Now, again, under the compact with the governor, um, we are being asked to reduce our non-resident enrollment to 18% over the next several years. Um, so that's also a factor in this. We were asked to increase essential student life academic program resources, for example, um, mental health resources, office for students with disability advising and TAs. Um, there have been some significant increases in some of these areas, such as CAPS, um, case managers. OS, uh, the Office for Student of Disabilities has had some modest growth. Advising has gone up and down, but has a little bit of growth. Um, and then there's growth in faculty FTEs. The new TA contract, however, is going to have ramifications on TA staffing. And so that is something that is a complication here. Next slide, please. Then we're asked to act on the recommendations of the Holistic Teaching Evaluation Work Group. That report had just come out in 2020. Um, since then, we've had an implementation committee followed by a standing committee. And um, as you probably know, we now have the, um, the sets that have replaced the CAPES. So the student evaluation of teaching that has been implemented and um, the standing committee is now starting to phase in the portfolio review and some faculty have begun to include portfolio reviews in their files. And then finally address cap major issue. This was what um, the committee heard the most from students concern about not being able to get into cap majors. There have been three committees that have looked at this and we now have um, a new procedure which has been a, has been endorsed by the academic senate it's a um it's a much more nimble procedure and it's also a more uniform procedure particularly around continuing students 
and it better addresses diversity and equity in some of these high high demand majors. So this is something that we're starting to roll out over the next year and or two, and um, you'll be hearing more about this. Um, there is a Senate administration work group that is drafting the interim report, and it's that report uh, draft will be due on May 1st, and then it will be distributed to the campus community, to the Senate, to other people um, for comment in advance of getting the interim report submitted on time, November 1st, 2024. And I think that's it. Next slide, please. All right, thank you so much, Don. Um, so we're now moving to our interactive portion of, uh, of this particular agenda item. So I'd like to ask all our attendees to go back to your Mentimeter window if you have it open. Um, if you have not yet logged on, uh, you can use the QR code that's on the screen or the link in the chat to connect to the feedback tool. So I'll give you a couple seconds to get over to Mentimeter and we'll get ready for our first question, which will be a short answer question. And uh, again, this is gonna be in response to the WASC midpoint report that we are uh, preparing due in November. And our first question, again, short answer, what successes do we want to highlight in our interim report? And I think we are going to share some of those responses live if I'm correct. Here we go. So again, feel free to uh, provide some short answer. Um, short, short answers to the question, what successes do we want to highlight in our interim report? What are we really proud of um, in our undergraduate education space? Give a little bit of time. Excellent. That's look great. Uh, we'll give folks a few more seconds to add in their responses. Okay, great. Well, thank you all so much uh, for, for those great responses. Um, if there is a challenge that you think should be addressed but is not listed, uh, we put uh, John Moore's um, uh, email address in the chat, uh, so feel free to share additional suggestions uh, with John. Okay, so this next question, uh, you're going to be ranking the options in order of importance with, again, one as most impactful and five as least impactful. And the question is, what challenges should we address? And again, the chart will react in real time as responses come in. So um, without further ado, please provide your responses. Excellent. It's really great to see the charts changing as responses come in. One of the great features of Mentimeter. All right. Okay, folks. Well, thank you again so much for participating. Um, please keep your Mentimeter screen open. You can always log back in using the QR code, but uh, we're going to continue to use this as uh, part of our feedback following each of today's presentations. And uh, back to you, Bob. 
Well, thank you, John and Allison. And now I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Academic Personnel, Cindy Palmer, who will discuss transparency in the academic personnel process. Cindy. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having me here. And wow, I can't wait to see our results of our questions on that Mentimeter. What a great tool that is. So much fun. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Cindy Palmer. I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Academic Personnel. I have probably seen many of you already. I've, I've gone to several departments um, during the fall and winter quarters. Um, but I realized that most of the uh, information that we've been sharing at department meetings has been to um, a small group of faculty participants and you know those who goes to the regular department meetings. So I'm glad for this opportunity to share more broadly with other academic appointees about all the, the great things that we're doing in APS. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these are a listing of some of the initiatives that my office has been unveiling this year. Um, starting with the first one, which is a transparency dashboard. And I think we've misnamed that. I mean, the, the intent behind the transparency dashboard was to allow appointees to see what's happening with the personnel review process in particular. The number one complaint we hear um, is that faculty and, and appointees work so hard to create their merit and promotion files and it goes into the queue and then no one hears anything again until it bubbles up months and months and months later. So we've created this transparency dashboard to allow folks to track the progress of that academic personnel review. But in the process of creating that dashboard, we also heard uh, the request for a one-stop shop of places to go to see all the other pieces of um, information that applies to a faculty member's daily work uh, life cycle. So the dashboard, and I'll share that in a minute, has a number of different areas, um, as well as the transparency to allow you to track that personnel review process. Embedded in that is our rollout of Interfolio and RPT and Faculty 180. What we've been telling or what I've been telling departments is that I am providing you with as many of the tools as I can to give you not only that transparency, but that ownership of uh, your process and the materials. But I encourage departments to use the tools once we give them to you. Um, you will recall likely that we made Interfolio RPT mandatory in 2019, but what we didn't make mandatory was how departments use it. We only require that files are submitted to central academic personnel in Interfolio RPT. You'll see in a second when I demonstrate the dashboard that the earlier departments opt in to use of Interfolio RPT, the more transparency you're going to have about where your file is in that uh, workflow. The other side of that is the Faculty 180, and this is our pilot effort to allow faculty to create an electronic version of a bio bib. In addition to that, we are working really hard on streamlining the ORS approval workflow. Um, we've heard you, we've heard that this process is long and cumbersome and doesn't allow you to be nimble. So my office has created some escalation processes so that there are less back and forth between the search committee and my office in order to get compliance to approve your different uh, workflows, your search report, your shortlist, and your search plan. Um, that has been pretty successful and we've reduced the number of back and forths and change requests by about 25% so far this year. And we're continuing to refine and improve that process. Um, the other thing that we're adding is the introduction of artificial intelligence in AP and using ServiceNow. We realize that faculty and staff have different work hours and aren't always on campus and aren't always available to go down the hall to ask somebody a question. So we're using AI and converting our process manual to more of an interactive format so that you can get the answers that you need in real time. Um, and with that is enhanced training. We also understand that uh, departmental staff is a very nimble workflow. And they move often um, amongst departments and units. And so there's not a lot of consistency in material available or that help. So we're creating some enhanced training products so that our training options are on demand. And so that staff and faculty can make use of the training material and get questions when they need them, rather than having to wait to um, go through a, a real person or pick up the phone or send an email or go down the hall to an office. And all of this is tying in with our conversion from paper products to some Kuali tools. All of the list of options that you're seeing here now are administrative appointments, our RTAD request, course overload, 
FSEP and faculty uh, leverage programs and um, ELSAs or entry-level salary agreements are all now on Kowalny. What this allows us to do is the transmitters or whoever submitted that request can now track the progress of that workflow. So it's not this big black box of where it got submitted and then someone just waiting for a response. You can actually see where it is as it goes through that process. Next slide, please. I encourage everyone here to make use of the APS website if you've not already done that. And you can find this material at aps.ucsd.edu. If you are following along with me now, this website is live. And this is how you're going to access that transparency dashboard that I talked about. At the very top of that page, you'll see a faculty resources uh, drawer. And if you scroll down to the bottom of that, you'll see bottom of that, sorry, you'll see useful links for faculty. If you click there, it takes you to the reviews transparency dashboards for faculty. I also want to point out that this isn't limited to faculty, and we are changing this name to academics, and it will be useful links for academic appointees. Um, once you click there, next slide, please, it takes you to this dashboard. This is where hopefully you can go for your one-stop shop. You'll see that there are a number of boxes there, including a place to go to look at your leave and service modification history, a place to go to look at all of your teaching evaluations. You can go directly to UC PATH from this location. And once in PATH, you can change your demographic data, you can change your home address if you move. You can look at your payroll information, um, anything that you can do in the PATH Center without having to go through that PATH portal, you can access directly here. You can also access Interfolio RPT, UC Oats, the bookstore, the uh, research page. And if you're involved in our pilot for Faculty 180 for that BioBib conversion to an electronic format, you can access that here. But the big money that I want to share with you is the current academic reviews and employment history box. If you click there, that will give you a number of pieces of information about yourself. If you are undergoing academic review at the very top of that page, it will show you where that file is in real time. It will show you the percentage of appointment from each department. It'll show you what the department is recommending, rank and step. It'll show you where the file is live as of this date, and it'll show you the date that the file went to that location. There's also a box there at the very end, it looks like an I, if you're following along. And if you click there, it'll show you the entire log, the back and forth of what has happened with that file since the time it was put into the Interfolio RPT product. There are also several sublinks on there. If you're following along, and even if you're not, you'll see that it shows you the workflow for your file review. So for example, it'll say you are in step nine of 17. There's a hyperlink there that will show you what those steps mean. There's a best practice that will show you what is required by policy. And then if you follow, scroll further down that page, it'll show you by department what your departmental workflow looks like. This is not only to help you follow along for your file, but to compare with other departments so you can see what is required and what the department may have self-imposed by adding extra steps to that workflow. All of this is in response to, uh, to faculty who want more control and more access to that material. So I hope it is helpful. Um, next slide, please. This is all a work in progress, not only the AP website, but this transparency dashboard. When we first envisioned this and rolled it out in September, there were only six boxes there. But based on feedback from you, from our academics, we've added three additional uh, boxes. This is not concrete. This is not built in. Um, we have plenty of room to change it and accommodate your requests. So this is how you can reach Bob and I, um, and we will look forward to receiving your input. Excellent. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, so again, here we are in our interactive uh, session um, after each uh, each presentation. So um, I think there's a QR code if you need to log into Mentimeter again. Um, but I think we're all used to this now. So the first question we're going to be asking is a ranked option. And again, one is most impactful, five is least impactful. And the question is, 
What other information would it be helpful to have available through the APS transparency dashboard? And we're going to uh, invite you to start providing responses or ranking the different categories. And we should be able to see in real time how these are changing. I almost feel like there should be some music to go along with this. Okay, we'll give folks a few more seconds to rank these different options. Okay, and again, uh, Cindy and Bob have provided their contact information. So um, if there's additional feedback that you'd like to provide, um, please do so. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to our next question, which again is a uh, short answer. Uh, what other topics should be addressed with a transparency dashboard? And again, we're going to show the responses uh, live as they as they come in. And in a moment, we should be shifting over so that we can start to see what folks are providing as responses. Okay, well, okay, so when we start to see the numbers of responses stay steady, we'll be ready to move on to our next question. And again, this is a short answer. And the question is, what other methods or tools can help us be more transparent and service oriented? And again, we will show the answers as they come in. In just a moment, you should start to see and again, we will be compiling all of these responses into a summary document. And I've just been reminded that you can continue to provide answers to these questions, even if we have moved on in our presentation. So uh, we'll be taking a look at what comes in and providing a summary um, in a few weeks once uh, after this town hall. Okay, so thanks again, everybody for participating. Uh, keep your Mentimeter screen open so that you can participate in um, the uh, feedback sessions following our last presentation. And I am going to hand it back over to you, Bob. Thank you, Cindy and Allison. Uh, next, I would like to welcome back our Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation, Corinne Peek Asa, to lead a conversation about research and innovation. Corey. Thank you. Yes, we're very excited to get um, some input on the themes, strategic areas moving forward. So next slide, please. As you know, we are a research and innovation powerhouse. That big B is uh, 1.76 billion in, in research. Um, we've been growing considerably. We don't always, always have to be in growth mode, but I think we have so many good ideas and, and so many uh, talented 
people to put those ideas forward, um, that I, I do see that we will have continued growth. Uh, but we will have difficult budget times. We're all aware of that. We're going to feel that at the federal and the, and the state level. We also might see it in industry and philanthropic giving um, and potentially in foundations. So we definitely will be uh, clever in, in where we approach the funds to do the work that will contribute to uh, uh, solving some of the big, hairy issues that we have facing us. Next slide, please. So we are ranked really highly. Um, there are a lot of rankings and um, I know that it's hard to remember which rank, which number goes with which ranking, but it doesn't matter which one. Um, we are ranked very highly. Our reputation is, is growing. What the chancellor refers to as our mind share is increasing. We are increasingly seen as um, thought leaders in so many different areas. And I, I put the rankings up here, but I want to you know, very intentionally say that the rankings are a symptom. They are not the what our goal is. If we continue to work together, encourage innovation, encourage discovery, encourage disciplinary and interdisciplinary thought, uh, if we are successful in leveraging our teaching mission with our research and innovation mission, with our uh, engagement outreach mission, we will have bigger success. Um, and so I, I like to tout our rankings, but I also want to acknowledge that they are the symptom of us doing the right work in the right way, which the next slide addresses a little bit. So we are really poised to increase our reputation as international thought leaders. I think that with our new global initiatives office, which has just been a delight to work with, um, we have an opportunity to, to act locally, regionally, statewide, nationally, and internationally. Uh, and I think that the, our ability, especially to, to move forward in the innovation space, innovation for commercialization, but also innovation for solutions, will be a, a very fun thing to continue engaging in. And we will be successful by doing the right work doing it in the right way. And that's part of my job to keep us compliant. While I do promise we also try to keep things as efficient as possible. We're working very hard on that. We have some good business systems, uh, processes and case studies ongoing. Um, and that we also are always looking for ways to do the right work in the right way, but not always having to do more work to have the big impact. Next slide, please. So the goals for strategic planning are that we wanna refresh the themes and there wasn't really a time built in the strategic planning process to do this. So we're collecting data on the themes, input on the themes. Do we wanna reword the four themes we have as a refresh? Are there a couple more, one or two that we also might need to add as we look into the future? Um, and then we also wanna think within these themes, where do we wanna strategically invest in our, what we want our reputation to be built on. And we will always be encouraging every direction of research that any faculty member, staff member, student wants to go in, but also recognizing that there needs to be some investment in strategic priorities. Uh, so trying to balance all of those levels, uh, we are always constantly thinking about. Um, so with I, that is really all I wanted to present. I think you guys know the research and discovery uh, uh, at, a, at a more local level than I do. So I think that next, I think look, next slide, we're ready to move into some questions that will really help us move forward in, in thinking about where our strategic opportunities lie. Excellent, thank you so much, Corey. Um, so again, here's the uh, QR code if you need to log in to Mentimeter and the link is in the chat. So we'll go ahead and start with our first question. Again, a ranking option in order of importance. One is most impactful, five is least impactful. And the question is, how would you prioritize investment in research and innovation growth? How would you prioritize investment in research and innovation growth? All right, now we can start to see some responses coming in. I know that this is gonna be of great interest to Corey and her team and the rest of us, where we should focus our energy.
Okay, we continue to see a couple more responses, but stabilizing. So we're ready to move on to our next question. And uh, for this one, it's going to be a little different from what we've done so far. We're going to generate a word cloud with your one or two word responses to the following question. What other areas would you prioritize for investment in research and growth beyond those that we've already mentioned uh, in the prior slide and in the presentation? What other areas would you prioritize for investment in research growth? So again, one or two word responses, and um, we're going to try to generate a word cloud. And those of you who remember word clouds, the size of the text gives you an idea of uh, which categories or responses get the most. really fun to see this evolve and change just over a couple of minutes. But seeing some responses really standing out and staying consistent. Okay, and again, you can continue to, to contribute. And we're gonna move on to our last question. Again, this is a short answer question and uh, we'll provide the responses live as they come in. And the question is, what activities might help us be successful in accelerating research priorities? What activities might help us be successful in accelerating research priorities? Again, this is a short answer. We'll wait for these to show up on the screen. This is our last question of the morning. And again, the windows will stay open as long as you have Mentimeter open. We can continue to provide responses even after we've moved on. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, everybody. We really appreciate all of you participating using today's Mentimeter, our first time using this in the faculty and research town halls. Uh, so based on your feedback, um, it looks like this is gonna be a really fun tool for us to use in the future. We're gonna gather all of the responses that you provided, including all of the short answers. Uh, we're gonna share these with our panelists and we'll provide a summary report in the weeks ahead as we start to pull together, pull together all of the information that you provided. You may now close Mentimeter. Thanks again, everybody. And back to you, Bob. Well, thank you, Corey and Allison. Uh, it's been very interesting to have our, our interactive part, but uh, we're going to go next to a more familiar part of this uh, town hall, and that's the Q&A part of the program. So I invite all of our panelists to turn on their cameras. And as a reminder to our audience, you can please go ahead and submit any questions you may have using the Q&A window. Um, while, uh, while we... So, you know, we, we did receive some questions in advance, and uh, I would like to move to one of those. And the first question then is for EVC Simmons. So EVC Simmons, what mechanisms for feedback will be used to make budgetary decisions through shared governance principles? Thanks very much. I will answer that in two parts. In our regular budget process, which happens each year through the winter and spring quarters, the chancellor and I start by meeting with the Senate leadership and the leaders of the Senate Committee on Planning and Budget to hear their input on guiding principles and areas of priority that the Senate and the faculty have identified. 
We also include them in the final presentations on all budget and strategy matters uh, by the vice chancellors at the end of the process in the summer. And a couple times a year, we also talk with Senate leadership about enrollment plans since those influence our largest budget resources. Now, more specifically this year, where we have a 3% budget cut that every vice chancellor has to implement because of the situation with the California state budget, I have consulted with deans, chairs, assistant deans, department budget officers, uh, Senate leadership, and uh, uh, committee on planning and budget leadership through a whole series of listening sessions where we discuss the principles that should be used for making the cuts. We started from the principles developed in 2020 through a shared governance task force that actually Bob led that had uh, lots of Senate and faculty and staff and leadership participation. Um, we started with those as, uh, as the beginning point and got feedback about how to modify those principles so that the principles we're using this year will reflect um, current understanding. So uh, to two part answer. Okay, well, thank you, EBC Simmons. The next question is for uh, Vice Chancellor Peak Asa. What metrics will be used to gauge the impacts of research and how will rankings be considered within that impact analysis? The second part of the question is, how will a researcher know they are considered successful by university standards? Well, as everyone is probably well aware, there are many layers of metrics and evaluation, starting with the individual faculty level. Um, primarily, that's through reviews at the department level. Uh, so those are a little different for every um, field. Um, and I think that, how do you know you're successful? One is if you're getting promoted, <laughs> but the other is do you feel like you're doing the work that you want to do. Um, and if you're not, but you feel like our office can help you or your school can help you align with the right funding opportunities, the right partners, um, definitely reach out to do that. Um, I think then moving up, you know, at the, the we look at rankings because they're an objective measure and we rely on a lot of those publication counts. How widely cited are those? Um, the things that often we care the most about, have we changed policy? Have we changed behavior? Have we advanced um, solutions to some of the challenges that we work on are, are hard to measure. Uh, those long-term impacts usually are collective. They usually have a lot of things that contribute. Um, sometimes despite really, really good contributions, they're not as quick a pace as sometimes the things that don't that aren't working as well. So if we think about AI, we might do a really good job advancing AI technology, AI ethics, AI accessibility and equity. Um, but it just may be the case that industry and or you know that the other things work faster than we do. Um, so I do think that we as a campus are having conversations about what are our values, how do we how, what different things do we value? Um, and I and that might lead to some interesting ways to think about how can we consider engagement? How can we consider, I mean, truly participatory bi-directional engagement, which, which takes a lot of time in research? How do we consider impact? So including things like changing policy, changing standards, changing um, innovation and getting products out to the market. How can we reflect that in our reward system? So uh, th this is a collective discussion uh, when we think about the metrics um, and, and they're complicated, they're qualitative and quantitative. Um, yeah, and, and certainly ideas and input is welcomed. Well, thank you, Vice Chancellor P. Asa. The next question is for Assistant Vice Chancellor Palmer. What mechanisms are available to talk to someone in academic personnel services when there is an urgent matter that cannot wait for a ticketing system? Oh, what a really good question. Um, I, I encouraged you during my presentation to peruse the academic personnel website, and I ask you to do that again. If you go on there, there is a, uh, a link for every staff member in my office and includes a phone number and an email address. Um, when we are out of our office on a remote workday, that phone number transfers to a cell phone. So we're always accessible, even if we're not on campus on site. Um, and I think we're going to drop the chat to the website or the link to the website in our chat. Um, we also don't use a ticketing system for that use. Our ticketing system is limited to access to our technical, our technical solutions or for technical help. But I am aware that my colleagues on the health sciences side also have a centralized AP unit, the ARC. Um, and if we can drop their link on the chat as well, 
they have access to a phone number that is monitored uh, all along the workday, and you can talk to a live person who can triage your question as well. So that um, applies to my health sciences colleagues. Thank you, uh, ABC Palmer. Uh, the next question is goes back to Vice Chancellor Peek Asa. What measures are being used to determine the social impacts of research and what areas of social impact are important to UC San Diego? Well, uh, excellent question. And I think that collectively, we have a real challenge measuring social impact. Uh, again, because social impact is a big change. It's not like we can tie one project to one major social change. Um, I mean, there are times we can do that and we certainly wanna celebrate that. Uh, so I think that, and it's also somewhat field specific in, in what uh, social impacts. Um, so I do think we, we have to think about, I, I don't have an answer. <laughs> this is something we need to decide uh, collectively. Um, but, but I think, you know, hopefully this is something that departments and units are, are doing and thinking about. Um, and then we can sort of raise up, we can look at main things like, are we changing policy? Do we have uh, evidence of, of culture change? How we tie that back to the research, again, is, is very complicated and it involves both qualitative and quantitative measures. And it's one of those challenges where we need to find the stories and we need to find measures that make sense. But it's one of those areas where we could spend more money on trying to figure out and collect data to measure this than, than we do doing the work itself. And then it becomes, you know, not so helpful and, and not a good use of our resources. So I'm not saying it's not important to understand what social impact that we have, um, but measuring it is tricky. And I think we have experts on our campus that could probably answer that question uh, better than I can. Yeah, if I could just add, I mean, I think it's incumbent upon every researcher to consider that uh, question. And I know with the NSF, for example, you're asked to, uh, to put your research in the context of broader impacts. So it's something we all need to be engaged with. Uh, I would now go to a question for ABC Jensen and Director Fragomeni. And the question is, how will the university make summer more accessible for students, particularly related to financial aid and housing limitations? Uh, excellent question. So the university has worked uh, quite hard over the last uh, couple of years to try to make summer a reality. Um, so we, we uh, increased uh, summer bridge that's a program specifically for underserved incoming students from about 300 students pre pandemic to 700 students last summer and our goal is to uh, hit 950 for this summer and that's a program where students get to take academic courses the some of them uh, get free housing they don't pay for the the units uh, the university covers them etc so that's on, on one side of the scale on the other side, we are working with advising, we're working with the financial aid office to communicate to existing students what financial aid solutions are available. Um, part of this is, you know, living on campus during summer can be expensive. And this is where the work with the units is really important. Part of the affordability equation when it comes to summer uh, is also the availability of remote courses, of online courses courses that students can take while they're living at home or while they're off doing an internship um, or, or another experiential uh, experience. Um, there, our understanding is that there hasn't been a wait list for housing, but you know, it, it's not, it's not uh, cheap to, to, to live on campus. Well, thank you for that uh, response. Uh, the next question goes to Dean Moore. How does the university define success and or improvement and is there a clear understanding across departments of, of these metrics? That's a great question, thank you. Um, so there are some very high level measures of success. So our four-year graduation rate is one, one very concrete high level uh, measure of success. And um, in, if we're talking about equity gaps, gaps in four-year graduation rates would be a way of measuring equity gaps. We also have first and second year retention data and we can see equity gaps, for example, in second year retention. So those are those are some of the high level measures. There are other measures, however, that that are more at the course level. So we can look at course. So so ABC Jensen mentioned DFW rates. Um, these are the rate the percentage of students who receive either a D, an F, or a W for a particular course. 
Some courses have relatively high DFW rates. Um, and again, we can see equity gaps in who is getting Ds, Fs, and Ws in terms of the percentage. On the other end of the scale, we can look at courses to see if there are equity gaps in who are who, who's getting A's versus B's. And this is actually very revealing because this really shows that if students are getting B's, they're actually being successful in these courses. But if they're not getting A's um, and there's a gap there, it, it suggests that um, there are things that we could do to try to support our students. How do, how do departments know about this? This is these are things that we have been discussing with all of the departments. We've had we've met with all of the departments over the past two years to talk about program reviews and talk about assessment cycles that would feed into the program reviews. And we've been talking about all of these measures as things that they could be looking at and assessing to to assess these these gaps. Okay, thank you, John. I'm gonna. I think this is gonna be our last question, and it goes back to you again, John. And it's related to the last one, but more specific, specifically focused on accreditation review. What are some of the accountability measures in place to ensure that the campus is addressing the eight areas of improvement we're expected to uh, work on? Yes, that's a, that's a very interesting question. First of all, mm -hmm. the, the eight areas are are not the same, and so um, who would be accountable for each of the eight areas is going to differ from area to area. But nevertheless, the highest level accountability, of course, is our, our reaffirmation of accreditation. We are on notice to address these in our next um, self-study, and um, our reaffirmation of accreditation will depend in part on how we've addressed these, these issues. So it's really incumbent on the, on the various campus office, some of them administrative offices, but also departments, to, to really um, take the lead in addressing this. We do have accountability meetings that um, are part of, of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Office um, Strategic Plan for Inclusive Excellence that, that touches on, on some, of the, some of the equity gaps that you see in departments. And so that is one measure of account, one mechanism for accountability. Um, and we are engaging the faculty in these conversations, particularly now that we're doing our interim report we have a Senate administration work group, and this is by design. This is so that um, the faculty are engaged in the drafting of this report and are aware of, of what we need to be addressing for our next reaccreditation. Thank you. And yes, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that is all the time we have for today. Uh, I want to thank everybody for their questions. I would also like to thank the presenters and guests for sharing their time and information with us today, and particularly the staff who helped put together our first uh, really interactive response uh, town hall. So I think this can be an important thing for us in the future. Uh, and I thank you as well for taking the time, the faculty and researchers of UC San Diego, to attend today and work continue to work together as a community. We had more than 120 attendees today, and I believe these town halls have become an important part of how we stay informed and united as a community. So we look forward to continuing with them. The next town hall will be for staff, and it'll be on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, March uh, 4, no, Tuesday, May 14th. You can visit the uh, HR staff town hall page to register as shown in the chat. Uh, so this concludes the faculty and research town hall. Again, thank you for joining us. Take care. Thank you for your contributions to UC San Diego, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.